Uh, hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Alex Says of Domain Dujac. Alec is in, in Maurice Sandini, I'm in darkest Sussex in the UK. Um, and we're, today we're going to be really talking about 2019 and a little bit about 2020. So we're yeah, welcome Alec, lovely to see you. Hello everyone. How, how are things in Burgundy right now? Um, things are things things are okay. Uh, we're, we've we've had a very strange season so far. Obviously, we had frost early on, which was uh, a sorry tale for most of France. Uh, for Burgundy, our whites suffered significantly. Uh, there'll be a very small white wine production because they were a little more advanced than the Pinot. The Pinot, well, it will depend from vineyard to vineyard. But if we do a little more than half a crop, I think I'll be quite happy with that. Um, on the bright side, we've just we finished flowering about 10 days ago, and that, we, that happened in fantastic circumstances, so at least we didn't lose anything at flowering. Did you, did you have some, um, some hail recently? I saw there was a little bit in just um, we, we, had some, we, had a few, we had a few spectacular storms in Burgundy, but so far most of, uh, most of the most of the vineyards have been spared. Uh, if they fell in Fissin, Brochon, uh, but, uh, and obviously some, some winemakers were impacted, but overall, most of us are doing all right. But you've had most of um, at you, it seems, over the past, the past 12 months. So I guess, where, what are we looking at now? Mid-September mid harvest or a little bit later? Yeah, I think, I, think we'll be, I think we'll be surprised by the whites because the quantities are small and they're announcing a rather warm one, uh, summer. So they might need to be picked just a little earlier around the 10th. But for the reds, mid-September looks nice. Unless we have another, another heat wave, massive heat wave this summer, we should be, we should be on a, on a, on a mid-September uh, mid harvest. And um, as regards to normality in Burgundy, all, all the restaurants back open now? Um, yes, yes, everything, everything is, is up and running again. Our table size is limited to six. Uh, nightclubs are reopening in three weeks, but that won't change my life much. Uh, <laughs> the numbers, numbers with COVID are great. It's all looking, it's all looking, it's all looking happy for now, but. The question is: Is this is this uh, the new safe, and, they're, and we're, we're out of it, or is this new, uh, this is just a new lull until it picks up again in the summer? Actually, and we, we should go back to wine in a, in a moment. But um, are France going to win the European Championships? Do you know that? I don't know. I'm feeling slightly less confident after the first round. I still <laughs> think I still think I still think we're in with a chance, but um, <laughs> never a given. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's go back. We just talked briefly about 2020, so let's go all the way back to 2019, where really the season begins, I guess, during winter time. How how was winter, the 1920 winter? So um, it's that kind of winter where you're thinking, ah, oh, global warming. There are no seasons anymore. It really wasn't a very cold winter. It was rather mild, a bit grey, dull. Um, we like a nice proper winter with ideally snow and a lot, of, a lot of rain and nice cool temperatures that clean out the pests and so forth. But that wasn't so much of an issue. At least we got some water, actually we got a fair amount of water. And, uh, but the, temperature, the temperatures rarely went below freezing if at all. Yeah, I remember in my, my much younger days, I, going to Burgundy, we, we'd, everything was a was a little bit later. Premier didn't happen in January, but we, we used to run taste in January and it was always bitterly cold. And that yep. <laughs> to be a, a thing of the past, really. Well, once upon a time when you were picking up wines in January, it used to snow and you get stuck somewhere in the courts <laughs> picking up samples. <laughs> uh, no, I think this year we had a proper winter. We actually had a, almost a week below freezing with uh, below zero temperatures. But in 2019, it was it was fairly warm and things stayed warm and we were very concerned that we'd uh, we'd have a we'd have a we'd be very exposed to frost uh which we came very close to but we 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 we, we got we got beyond frost and then um we after after a reasonably early bud break we got fairly cool temperatures and that slowed down it slowed down the vintage significantly 
And for flowering happen in good conditions or difficult conditions? Do you, mean, did you say flowering? Flowering, yeah. Yeah. Um, it started off very well, nice and sunny, and then we were hit by a uh, by, uh, by thunderstorm after thunderstorm. So no, it wasn't it wasn't ideal. And I think um, we're looking at a reasonably small crop, and that's where it starts. Um, after after flowering, we we got we got a fairly, that was early June, and we got a fairly wet month of June. Uh, and then we were then we came into July with a lot with very warm temperatures. Uh, we had two or three major heat waves that summer, so that was unusual and uh, a bit scary. On the bright side, they didn't last very long. Every we had episodes about a week long, but not much more. So I don't think it had a real impact on um, on ripening. If it would if it stayed too warm too long, maybe the vineyards would have blocked somewhat. But ripening was fairly even. The big problem was after that there really wasn't much rain during the entire summer, and if you don't have much water, you don't have much juice at the end of it. And we were lucky in the sense that. Because the crop was rather small and it rained just enough at the right times that there wasn't really um, an impact in terms of ripening because of the rain. There's no blockage. The, um, the crop was destined to be rather small. On top of which, during the heat waves, we did lose a few berries that were burnt by the sun. Um, but the combination of burnt berries, bad flowering, and the lack of water means the 2019 crop is definitely below average in terms of size. Uh, did, you, did, did you see a big difference in yield size between the, the older vines and the younger vines? So the older vines obviously with a deeper root system were able to... Yes, no, there's, there, there's certainly... There, there was certainly an impact on vineyard age, but it was not as big as you could imagine. Now there was what um this is a, this is an aside, but I, I, it's a, it was an important one for me, so I'll mention it. It rained just before five days, maybe before uh, before we picked, which usually is not significant. It's too it's too late in the game to have a major impact, and yet uh, when we were picking, I was surprised at how some vineyard had responded very well to the rain. Uh, and looking around, some of my neighbors weren't so lucky. And thinking about why that might happen, it really is comforting us, or me personally, in, our, in, our, in the way we conduct our vineyards, organic and biodynamic. Um, you can't explain, it's empirical. You look at it and you try to, you can't, I can't prove this, but I felt that our soils maybe are just not as compact as others, as some. We drained just a bit more. Maybe the maybe the vineyard were being in better, slightly better condition, took more advantage of that rain. Uh, undeniably, there was an impact on yields, uh, a small one, but it partially explains why in 2019s, where our yields are uneven from one vineyard to the next. You you've got some places you've got still a bit more rain before before harvest, and fared just a bit better in terms of quantities. Did you, did you notice a lot of variation from village to village as well? Obviously, you've got vineyards mm. like every and more and um, not so much. It's a, it's a good point, and, and I hadn't thought about it much. But no, there wasn't. It, you know, in two thousand and sixteen, with the frost, obviously, places like Chambol were completely devastated, and we had actually nice yields in Lorraine and really bad yields in Chambol. There's no two thousand nineteen. Some vineyards are better than than others, but. I don't think it was on a village base. Vineyard age might be one impact, or just where where they had, where where we got a little more lucky than others. But can't, it's hard to pinpoint. And the Chardonnay down in in, in the Côte de Beaune, um, Obviously, you've got two wonderful Bellini vineyards down there. How how did they fare in nineteen? They were they were picked first, and they were picked before the rain, so the yields were rather low. Uh, but but. But we were, when we picked, we were very happy because um, in a warm summer, you always worry about acidity. And the balance of the wine when we picked was great. That was very comforting. I think that's, um, that is uh, that's something that, goes, that comes across all the 19s. When you're, when you're picking after a warm summer, your, your main concern is if you're going to get ripe a little too fast, you're going to have wines which are high in alcohol and low in acidity and make them a little heavy. And the 19s aren't like that. For some, you know, the, the, the nights were cold enough. We kept, we get, plenty, we get 
enough acidity to counterbalance the ripeness. And it's a, it's a really nice blend between the two. And I think that's one of the keys to the vintage. You've got the, the two vineyards you've got, Caire and uh, Filatier. No, Filatier and uh, Filatier and, uh, yeah, the Filatier and the Combet. Combet, so, sorry, uh, yeah. Two, two have, vineyards. What's, what's, I mean, th these were vineyards you, you, you acquired how long ago? The first vintage is 2014. They're a fermage. We don't own the vineyards, but they're long-term lease. So we, we treat them pretty much as like they're, as they're our own. We, we do everything, they come in the, the, the domain label because we do pretty much everything. We, we tend them all year round. Um, let's start, the differences between the two beyond just being two different terroirs, we have pretty much double the surface of Folatia compared to Combets. Um, so roughly 1.2 hectares of Folatia for 0 0.6 of Combets. And the biggest difference between the two is age vineyard. The vineyard of the, the age of the vineyards. The, uh, the Folatière have been mostly replanted at this stage. So uh, the oldest vines in the Folatière are somewhere between 20 and 25, but a lot of those vineyards were planted less than 10 years ago. So we don't, we don't achieve the same depth of wine right now in the Folatière, but I don't think this is forever. I think this is, these are young vineyards. After 13 years old, you reach adult size in terms of uh, in terms of root system, and that's the first peak. And after 30, you you reach a nice age in which you just get a bit more from the vineyards. So we're slowly getting there. And the combat is the other extreme. They're very old vineyards, and some of it will have to be replanted rather soon because it's um, the yields are getting rather low. But on the bright side, you know, small yields and, and very old vineyards do produce, just give you that little extra. So the yields are a little lower and we're getting, we're getting a little more density in the wine and just a little more complexity. And the soil differences between the two sides? They're not very big. They're obviously, they're, obviously there's some, the, the exposition, the slope is a little different as well. But, um, but we're in pretty neat. And if you compare, if you contrary to one of the other whites, like the Mont Vizan, Mont Vizan is on a very sandy um, limestone soil with a lot of natural acidity. They're very lean wines. Uh, I'd say very vertical. Um, pretty neat is the opposite. Um, it, has, it has a nice natural acidity, but it's got a lot more clay. And that gives wine a certain amount of richness. Not, not heaviness, but just, Richness and while the while the the Mont Vizan is lean, the the um, the, the Prunines are much more are much more giving, and there's there's a nice horizontality to it as a result, and it's really nice to have them side by side. I just want to add, comparing the contrasting the Prunini Folatia um, with the Combet, uh, the the Combet will give you more in time, but as a young wine, I think the Prunini is a little lighter, but offers a lot. Uh, the Folatia offered just a little more in their youth. And in terms of vinification, are they, they both handled the same way? Yes. No, we, 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 make, we make our whites pretty much, we, we adapt to each vineyard, of course, but they're, they're, they're handled rather, rather the same in terms of wood, in terms of the arrive, we'll give them a little, a little stomping just to extract a bit of tannin from the whites. Then we'll press them, we'll leave them overnight to, to um, um, to deposit just somewhat the, the well, and then we'll rack into barrel, barrel fermentation. We don't use a lot of wood, uh, a lot of new wood, sorry. Um, I'd say about 10 to 15% new wood. Then we try to keep them in cask for about a year, and then we move them to steel tanks where they'll stay for another six months. Yeah, the, that six months is quite crucial, I would imagine. This is this is definitely uh, this is not this is no longer a new trend. This is something that's been going on in Burgundy for ten to fifteen years. Um, everybody agrees that keeping the wines on lees and prolonging the alvage is interesting in terms of uh, nurturing the wines a little longer. But we're all concerned. You know, after the two thousands, we a lot of people moved away from too much new woods. You know, there was a lot of oaky Chardonnays out there and everybody's conscious about, well, most people are conscious about it. And we're trying, we're trying to make sure that there's not too much wood in wines. So put them in steel, in steel, 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 steel tanks allows us to, to, to keep them on leaves a little longer at the same time, not having the extra wood in the wine. Yeah. When, so what was the actual, can you remember the actual official starting date of, um, 
of harvest for, um, for the uh, for the Polinis. It's a long time ago now. <laughs> actually, actually, I do because I took some cheat. I took some, I took I took, I took a, a sheet to sheet. <laughs> yeah. It we started on the Polini on the tenth of September, and the reds about four days afterwards. And I presume a couple of days to bring in the the Polinis, or you can do it. Usually, 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 we do the Polini over two days. We do uh, the combat on the first day, and that's. We, we start early in the morning and we're done just after lunchtime and uh, the combat the following day, which takes two to three hours depending on the size of the crop. Um, but that's more relaxing because after that we can come back, we can come back to the men and in the afternoon we can start barreling the first whites. And how, how are the pHs on the two Polinis? Are they relatively, relatively low? Or? Uh, I don't have... I, I really don't have the figures in mind, but I remember that the, the numbers were rather good. So yes. Yeah, yeah. Any idea on? I mean, we've we've got people who are going to lucky enough to be able to get a, get their hands on a few bottles. Uh, any advice on to when they should take the corks out? Um, it's early days, but generally speaking, I think if the the folatier are not are, are meant to be drunk on the young side they're not they're not old the vineyards are old enough to be to be to be kept for a very long time so i'd recommend you know if you can give them a couple of years you'll certainly you'll certainly get just a bit more from them but you can open them fairly soon the folatier are, are have a little more to offer in terms of depth but that it's a bit like reds but less marked than reds you you not you can have a little less fruit as a result well, the Folatia has got great food almost immediately. The Combet, you're going to have to wait just a little bit more. So I give the Folatia, if you could, at least five years. But on the bright side, if you want to keep them for, for a long time, these are wines which will age beautifully. Mm. Yeah, I mean, having revisited one or two 19s, uh, white 19s, it's a vintage that um, I think is really going to surprise to the upside. I, I think people saw that heat, but the, the resulting wines seem incredibly well balanced no i have i have i have distinct souvenirs of, uh, of looking at the numbers before we start picking the uh, picking the whites and thinking wow those are great acidities i i, I really wasn't expecting something so positive so uh, uh, yes I, I think there's i think uh, it's easy to underestimate whites in warm years but uh I, people will have a nice surprise and just briefly before we talk about the red wines the so your your moray blanc so you happy with those as well you know yeah, uh, yes, but what I find surprising is Moray Blanc, the Mont Vizan, uh, uh, as I said earlier, in, uh, is on a limestone soil, and has plenty of natural acidity, so in warm vintage we're never concerned, we always get enough acidity. The Moray Blanc, in contrast, are on, uh, on the bottom on the bottom of Moray saint -Denis. there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of clay there, and I always worry about how they're going to do when it's a, in a warm, in a warm vintage. And yet, when I look back on what I like best in our Moray Blanc, 2009 comes to mind. It was, uh, I served that at my wedding. It was, it was surprising, it was surprising one of our best wines, and it was in a warm summer. So it carry, it usually, it, it does all right, the, uh, the cities, the cities are, are not as good, obviously, as the Pyrenees or the Mont Vizan, but they're good nonetheless, and I think I think they make they're going to make for another another really nice vintage. Mm. Well, we look forward to uh, to drinking both uh, over over the coming years. Um, so, to, 2019, the Reds. Then, is there can one generalize much about them, or do we need to be very specific, village by village? No, I think I think I think we can we can look at them overall. No, there's this is you know some 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 vintages you feel that some village do better than others. I think in nineteen some wines will do better than other, but not not by much. I think it's I think I think the uh, it's the overall quality is quite outstanding. What's the average age of the of the, the, the vineyards in in the Cote de Nuit now that you have? Um. I'd, I'd round it off around 35 years old. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. most, most of the domain was replanted by my father in the, in the late 70s, 80s, and, uh, and continuing until the 90s. We've, we've replanted a bit of Clos and and Moïse and the Premier Cru in the last decade or so. But we stopped replanting mainly in the 90s. So we're reaching an average age of, 90, uh, of, tw of 35, maybe a bit more on some, a bit less on others, but on average 35, which is a nice place to be. Yeah, no, that's almost yeah, almost ideal, isn't it? To get that balance between 
Uh, it's great. It's great if all your vineyards could be 60, but you've got to retire fairly soon after that. <laughs> <laughs> also, you probably wouldn't get much much juice out of them either. So um... no, it's, it's it's it is it is it's a balancing act between between having a, a, a yields which are reasonable and at the same time aging your vineyard and slowly having yields which are dropping too fast. Hmm. But and in terms of we, we talked briefly about the vinification of the white wines. Have you changed much with the vinification of the reds over recent years? All right. Um, so generally speaking, my, my, my first answer will be no. We, my brother and I grew up with my father's wines, and the idea is really to continue making wines in the same fashion. However, we've had to adapt to global warming. We are now picking a lot warmer, a lot riper, and earlier that my father used to. Last, in 2020, we finished picking in August. No, we didn't start, we finished in August. So that was a shock. Um, and it is, it, in, in many ways, it is a nice problem because whereas Burgundy has always been underripe, we're now picking ripe. And that's good news, but you have to adapt to that. Uh, and our solution, which we've been doing pretty much every year since 2014, is to move ourselves from uh, the extraction we used to do to more an idea of infusion, which is uh, in, the, in the 2000s, we probably punched down twice a day on most wines for a week. Now, in the, first, in the first few days, when there's not a lot of alcohol and the tanks are reasonably cool, we'll punch down once. And as soon as soon as fermentation as fermentation is picked up and we feel tannins are coming out by themselves, then we'll just do a, a light pump over to keep to keep them to things geared to sorry to keep things going. But but we consider tannins are ripe enough that they'll come out. The danger with the ripe vintage is ripe tannins are easy to extract. They come out very easily. And it is something we're looking back on some of the warmer vintage we've done, we feel that. 2005, for instance, are rather tight because maybe we push extraction a little far at the time. They're great mm -hmm. wines, but they're very hard to approach, and it's been 15 years already. So, if you if we if we allow the tannins to come out themselves, the better the tannins, the easiest they come out. So the better tannins are kind of come out, we get a very nice tannic structure, and we don't push it more than we should. And I think that's the main difference in the last 10 years, and I. I the other thing is we've turned down the amount of wood you we use because the riper the vintage, the more tannins you're going to extract from the, from the barrel. So to get the wood levels we used to have, we need a lot less new oak. In terms of riper wines, richer wines potentially, um, where does that leave whole bunch? Well, I, 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 want, I just want to react to that because we're talking riper, we're not necessarily talking richer in terms of alcohol. We're not, we're not that much richer than we were in the past. We're, our, our wines are, are usually between 13, 13.5. Not saying there's not a couple which have gone to 13.8, but most of our wines, even warmer vintages, we pick early enough that we can stay, the alcohol doesn't go above 14, or very, very rarely so. Um, so that was my first point, and back to your question, which was, Oh yeah, a whole bunch. I mean, if, if, as, a whole bunch. Yes. Yeah, as your approach um, to that evolved well, the, as well. The um, yes and no. We're very much a whole <laughs> bunch of men. We've stayed a whole bunch of men. The uh, the the beauty of having right vintages like we have means we can use as much stem as we want. In the past, uh, and that was true for my father before us, if you get a vintage where the stems aren't completely ripe, you can't put as much as you want. You have to turn it down a bit. Otherwise, there'll be greenness in your wines. We're now working with stems which are which are very ripe, so we can use almost 100%. What we tend to do these days is um, is to stem just a bit, so we can get some juice at the bottom of the tank, and then we fill with whole cluster. Uh, and uh, that's that means on average we're closer maybe to 90% rather than 100%. But that's that's where we're at right now. And do you think that the, that whole bunch brings greater precision as well as greater freshness or the we lose a tiny bit of acidity due to uh, due to the whole bunch but generally speaking the, there seems to be a consensus that brings a little freshness to the wines i 
I, uh, I can't prove it either way. I can't, you know, sometimes stems are magical and they do everything or, they, or they're the worst of everything. I think, I think the, the wines have done well despite the warm weather and there's, there's been a nice freshness in our wines in the last five years. Uh, stems might be part of this and, that'd be, and that's great, but, um, but I like to think it's not single factor. It's also our decision to pick on the earlier sides and, and to keep the alcohol low. Do you think actually with riper, riper stems you actually they the the, the scent the, the the terroir is perhaps is more expressive than than with up with less ripe stems no um, that's a difficult one i'm not quite sure what the impact there's there's definitely when you make wine the whole cluster there's definitely a little you can even though the the stems won't necessarily come out of the wine it's a little difference. You can, it's hard to put your finger on it, but most of the time you can tell when a winemaker is being using whole bunches. Whether it has an impact on the terroir, it's hard to say. I think that it also, there's, all, there's so many other things coming in to how much extraction, how ripe the, grip, the grips are. Um, having the acidity to, just keep, to keep, to keep the, the precision in the wine, um, it's hard to balance. But uh, that's, that's when, I was reacquainting myself with the 19s at lunch today just to, to, to prepare for this. And I, was, I, I thought, wow, there's a, there's a surprising amount of precision in 19s. And I think that the, 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 ba the balance is good. And you do feel there's, there's, some ripe, there's some ripe juicy tannins in those wines, but they're nicely held together. There's a nice, there's a, there's a nice balance and nice precision to them. And I was trying to think of vintages that resemble 19, I think. It's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to compare. It is quite a unique vintage in its own right. And it kind of stands out for all the right reasons. Yeah, I think with the change in climate, we, you are setting brand new wines that have no, no comparisons really. Um, my, my, my father, my father, my father is repeating saying, oh, this is a new 2005. But I think it's very different in style from 2005, but I can see where he's coming from. These are very healthy, very ripe grapes with a nice, nice, nice balance. They're gonna have really nice length. These are, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is part of, uh, this is yet another good vintage for Burgundy and we're gonna lose all credibility if we keep on saying we only do good vintages, but this is a golden age. This is, this is the, there are many downsides to global warming, but one of the upsides for us has been working with riper grapes. And it's easier to make great wine when your grapes are ripe than when they're just all lacking in ripeness. It's obvious, but none that's true. And actually that freshness and the natural concentration, they should ensure the wines have quite a long life. The, uh, well, when, when aging wine, you've got, I think the first thing about aging a wine is balance. You need balance because if, you're, if your balance is not there, the wines are only gonna get worse with time. Then you need, you need, you need acidity, of course, just to keep things, protect the wine so much. But that's not as important as having good fruit to begin with. Um, my father's 69 had actually really low acidity. There wasn't that much. Um, they're still, they're, they're, the bottles are starting to feel a little tired, but the magnums are holding out beautifully. <laughs> These are wines which have aged very well. And you can, you can get away with, if, if everything is well, you can, your city doesn't have to be that high to actually keep the wines a long time. I'm going to ask you a very, probably a very silly question to ask you because it's, it's going to make everyone cl clamour for, for whatever, whatever you say, but do you have any, any personal favourites from the range in 2019? Well, I'm not going to be very original. They, 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 te they tend to be the same as always, but um, nothing, in certain vintages, some wines stand out in 19s. They're very good across the board. So there's no, there's no one. I like the Clos La Roche a lot right now, but uh, I always like the Clos La Roche a bit. When he's very young, the Clos La Roche tends to overshadow the Clos Saint Denis so much. And I, eventually I think the Clos Saint Denis catches up. And at very old age, I think Clos La Roche takes that lead again, but you know, it changes a bit. Marc Ponsard are very well, are very showing, we're showing very well. The, the Combat also, but um, almost everything is, is a, this is not a difficult vintage where you have to cherry pick. This is a vintage where everybody should make rather good wine. Yeah, I must admit, I, I, as you know, I've always been a, a close Saint Denis fan, but I think 
I think I'd be happy to have anything this year. It's such no, yeah. This is I mean there there's always there, there's always personal preferences coming into this. But this is rather even vintage. There everything everything was ripe, everything performed very strongly and uh, and some wines will be maybe just a little easier young and some wines will, will show their best a little later. But uh, this is a vintage which should be reasonably approachable at a young age and should really age very well. So nice all around. So almost the perfect vintage. That's... You know, the perfect vintage we've made twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alec, thank you very much for that. That seems the, the <laughs> ideal place to stop really on a really positive note. It's been fascinating um, listening to your insights on, on this vintage. And uh, well, well, let's say all our, all our loyal customers and collectors are, are going to be receiving the offer shortly. So that they'll be delighted to get your so your inside information on this wonderful vintage. So thank you very much. No, it's my pleasure. I hope I hope uh, you all enjoy the wines and have a good time with the 19th. They shouldn't disappoint. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Eric. All, right, all my best. Bye.